ordinary family. My, my father worked in a factory painting tractors. And um, there was no real interest in high culture in my house, but there was a piano. And I found this fascinating. So I started to uh, learn to play. And I went to the local man around the corner. And his idea was that you would uh, learn the basics with a few of the classics and then you'd get on to playing jazz. Uh, and a little way into this um, uh, formation, I um, was given a piece by Mozart, one of the some easy sonatas. Uh, and I, you know, I never heard of Mozart. That it was amazing. I, I thought, this is incredible. So I saved up my pocket money, which was probably about equivalent of half a euro a week for uh, 16 weeks and bought myself the album of Mozart sonatas from the local shop and began to play. Uh, but the other thing I discovered when I was young was uh, in the music shop there was um, this strange music with no notes on it. Well, that's interesting. So I bought one of these things. It was a manuscript book and I started to write music. So essentially I'm a self-taught composer with no cultural background. <laughs> and um, I, eventually I went off to university. I, I considered studying music, but my parents and my school advised me against it because, you know, how would I make a living? Uh, and I was good at science, so I went to study chemistry. But after two terms of chemistry, I decided I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go to study music. So I started studying music. So that's, that's the start of the story. Now, very much later, of course, um, music technology became important. And uh, the first thing that triggered my interest was when my father died. I was studying as a graduate. And I was writing, I would say, pastiche Zanakis at the time. And I thought, what on earth has this got to do with his life? And so very naively, I bought a small portable tape recorder very cheap, very low quality. I uh, went out record making recordings in factories and power stations and made my first electroacoustic piece. Uh, very much related to the real world. That was the important thing. Uh, and I made several more. The, the most important one of that early career was Red Bird, where I became more uh, non represent It was representational, but in a mythical way rather than directly. Then uh, computers came along. Now, this, this was wonderful for me because I had a, a certain ability with mathematics. I could understand the physics, and it was very natural for me to uh, move into working with computers, not only for making the music, but also for writing the software to make the music. And that, that was also important from another point of view because uh, when I began working as, as an artist, as, as a university student, I met various experimental theatre groups, performance artists, who actually made a living by doing performances and getting grants and things. And I decided that's what I want to do. Because mo most people who study music as composers, they go on to be academics, because that's the only way to earn money, unless you're a barrier or Stockhausen or something, but generally speaking. So I did that, but that meant I was very poor. Uh, so computers... Uh, were a wonderful lifeline to me because in the early days of techno music technology uh, people would buy these units made by say Yamaha or Sony uh, and they worked in universities so they'd buy one, they'd make these pieces then at the end of the year Yamaha would say oh now we've got a new unit, you have to buy this unit and they'd buy another one so it went on because they had a budget. I had no budget uh, but I met my friends in university and they said we have this device that can do this. And I thought, oh, I wonder if I can program that. <laughs> now the advantage of this is it, it takes lots of time, but it's free, <laughs> and also you can change it. So if the manufacturer decides that they don't want to do this, you're, you're basically stuffed. But if you program, you can say, oh, well actually no, I would like to make a piece that's 72 hours long. Or cut something to, or cut something to, you know, a millisecond. You know, you could do all these things. Uh, so th this was a marriage made in heaven. You know, I, I like programming. I like composing. For various reasons, I was asked to um, 
participate in, in a project with scientists uh, to somehow see if we could work together on a research project. Now that didn't quite work, but what I did do, I um, decided to make a piece using scientific data. Was it possible to make music out of scientific data? Now the, the first problem with this is that the scientific data may be really interesting f from a scientific point of view, but that doesn't mean to say it's at all interesting musically. Uh, I, and in fact, I wrote lots of programs, programs that would convert data into pitch, into control files, into filter uh, coordinates, into spatialization, everything. But in the end, most of the results just sounded random. It would have been the same if you'd put random numbers in. So my first thing was, what data, would, what data has some kind of structure that might lend itself to music? And I came up with two things. The first was supernova explosions. Now, th now these are very, very interesting scientifically. Uh, they're also very significant to us because, because of the nature of, the, of stars, when the stars form all the chemical elements up as far as iron, then iron is very stable and the star dies. But there are lots of elements beyond iron in the periodic table which we are dependent on as living things. They're part of us. So how are these made? Well, they're actually made in supernova explosions. That's the only place we know they're made. So the, the, poetically, this is quite significant. Uh, but the next problem is how to turn the data into sound. So essentially, I take the light spectrum of this explosion, which lasts for 64 days. Uh, I decided a piece lasting 64 days might test the listener too much. So I shortened that to nine minutes. Uh, and then I, it, it wasn't completely straightforward to convert the light spectrum into sound. There are various complications. If you're not careful, you just end up with noise. Uh, but I, I figured out a method eventually to convert the interesting information in the spectrum, in fact, the peaks and the troughs, which actually indicate the presence of elements being generated in the supernova, and convert those into sound. Um, and these sounds move through you in the space, in, a, in, a, in sound surround. And at the end of the piece, because the uh, supernova generates these elements, but it gets very, 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 um, shall we say, in terms of sound, extremely quiet, inaudible. So at the end of the piece, I decided to use the spectra of the elements as, as emerging from the sound of the supernova. So that's the first piece. The second piece, um, I know everyone's already done this, but the, an obvious thing to do is to work with chaos. How do you make a piece which is not simply chaotic? So uh, the, the piece has two kinds of material. The first kind of material is to do with something called the logistic equation, which is a very simple description of population dynamics of a, a predator and, and its prey, and what happens in the balance of the population. And uh, you, mathematically, you can show that if you push the environmental conditions eventually the relationship becomes chaotic. So the, the material at the beginning and the end of this piece, this is called Signatures of Chaos, is this gradual emergence of chaos. And this is done by mapping the population uh, fluctuation as uh, melodic lines, essentially. Um, there, there are lots of other complications, but I, I won't explain this. Now in the center, I work with another kind of chaos, which is turbulence. In fluid flow, when you see a very uh, calm-looking river, this is called laminar flow. But uh, when it's flowing over rocks or it's buffeted by the wind, you get something called turbulent flow. And what's interesting is the way you move from laminar flow, smoothness, into turbulence. And there's a particularly interesting um, phenomenon here. If you spin a liquid around, it begins and looks completely smooth. And then at a certain speed, it starts to rotate in little bands like this. Whoops, I can't do this. <laughs> like this, you know, <laughs> uh, against each other. And then those bands themselves start to become turbulent. And finally, the whole thing becomes turbulent. And this thing is called taylor Kuat flow. So what I've tried to create is an analogue in sound surround of this kind of fluid flow and the gradual breakdown of the fluid into turbulence. And then I was stuck. I couldn't think of any other material to use uh, that had this kind of structure. I couldn't find anything that really interested me. 
when I was approached by the Ness Group at the University of Edinburgh who were making physical models of musical instruments. Now, by a physical model, they don't mean what you might think. What they mean is a, a description in a computer in a precise physical way of what the instrument does. So how long is it, what exactly is its shape, uh, where are the valves, how many are the, how, how far down, what is the air pressure, what is the tension on the lips, what's the weight of the lip, everything, absolutely everything. Uh, now, the first problem with this is, of course, if I want to use, an, uh, say, a brass instrument, it's easier to use a microphone, so why bother? Uh, the, the answer is, what if I want a, a brass instrument that's uh, a kilometre long? Or one that has 16 valves, which are all being played at once, which happens in this piece. Or one in which the, the lips have are incredibly stiff and heavy, so they're not human. Or the pressure is the pressure of a jet engine. Or, in fact, in this, in this piece, twice the pressure of a jet engine, sometimes. You could do all that with a physical model. If, if you, of course, if, for example, if you blow it, don't put enough air pressure in it, won't make a sound, just like a, a physical instrument wouldn't. But you can do these things that, in theory, could exist physically, even though they don't. So, and the poetic of this piece is, uh, at the time, we, we just began to discover these Earth-like planets. And I, I wondered, what it, would it be like if we arrived at one of these planets, and we could uh, walk on the surface, we could, we could breathe, and all, all those kind of things. So, clearly, the air pressure would be the same. Uh, the laws of physics would be the same. So, there could be music. But what we don't know about this music is not only the cultural things, what, how they would make music, but also their instrument technology. So let's make a piece, an imaginative piece, of um, a welcoming ceremony for brass and percussion instruments, all imaginary, on the planet Kepler-63c. There are kind of two answers to that. I enjoy both the precision of the computer making something like a sculptor where, we, where you can specify everything. So I don't do any electronic work in real time, for example. Uh, in real time, where the electronics generates the sound as you perform. I, I take it all the way into the studio and do it out of real time so I can mould it exactly as I like. I really enjoy that. But I also like improvising. And in fact, I was involved in the free improvisation movement in Britain from the earliest days. Um, and uh, I, I, I've never in, in my, you can, I can't explain this, but never in my life put these two things together. I either do completely off the wall improvisation, I just go in, sit, I sit in front of the audience and I begin. I don't prepare anything. I have quite an extensive repertoire because I've researched what can be done with the voice. But uh, that's like that. In the studio, I sit there for hours, in fact, years, working at the details of things. Um, but for me, the electric music work is, uh, I always say, it's a little bit like very slow improvisation. Because the thing about being an electroacoustic composer, if you're working with real world sounds, no matter how much experience you have, you can never know precisely how your sound will uh, react when you process it. Um, it's like you have to discover it. So you, you can have this wonderful plan about what you're going to do, then you, you get your recording, and when you bring your recording to the studio and use your plan, it's really boring. Or it just simply doesn't do what you want. And you have to go with the grain of the sound itself. So you have to be prepared to change your plans, to improvise. To, you might even throw the plan out of the window and do something else, but generally you, you have to have a vague notion, now, well, a, a sort of rough notion of the formal structure you would like, but the details, uh, the infilling, everything has to be something that is possible with the sound material. And that depends on trying things, playing them, liking them, not liking them, altering them, not liking them, altering more, and it gets worse, trying something completely different, so on. It's improvising. It's very, very slow improvising, but it's, to me, they don't seem that different. 